Conversation with the Candidate continues. Thank you for clicking on our extended digital conversation with the candidate. With the candidate here this week, Tom Steyer. We've got 30 minutes commercial free of questions from New Hampshire voters, and we're going to jump right into things with Terrence Guinarain. Thank you for being here. Um, there will be candidates on the Democratic side and some on the Republican side that would say, um, head, fund ma head fund managers like yourself are responsible for the wealth gap between the wealthy and middle class and are also responsible for the 2008 financial crisis. How would you address that? So um, let's first, that's two questions. One is about the income gap and the other one is about the crisis. So let me talk about the income gap for a second. Since 1980, so that's 40 years, all of the increased income in the United States has gone to the richest Americans, all of it. And that has been done because it has gone to the people who own and who run corporations. The corporate take in our society has done nothing but go up, and everybody who's associated with it has benefited disproportionately, and everybody else has basically been stagnant for 40 years. Traditionally in America, that is not at all how it worked. Traditionally in America, a rising tide lifted all boats. So the question is, how did that happen? And the answer is, honestly, what I'm talking about. It's a corporate takeover of our government. If you look at the rights of working people, they've been attacked systematically, legally, around the country thousands of times. You know, if you look at the rights of people to organize, the rights of people to sue their employers, minimum wage, uh, uh, the so-called right-to-work states, which are really an attempt to prevent people from organizing. There has been a concerted attack on working people and organized labor for 40 years that's been very successful. In addition, if you look at just the tax rules over the last 40 years, all the tax cuts have vastly disproportionately helped rich people and corporations. If you look at the tax cut from last year, that was you know, directly a cor basically a corporate tax cut with a huge tax cut for rich people and a very modest tax cut for working people. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So when you think about how to redress that and what the cause of it is, I am not anti-capitalist. I'm a believer in the, the private sector runs 90% of America. It drives innovation. It drives you know, job growth, it drives prosperity. Here's what I'm opposed to. I don't want corporations writing the laws about how they operate. If we have, a, if people in the United States tomorrow, today, are gonna have to go to a gas station to fill up. I'm a huge climate hawk, but I know that's true. There has to be a corporation to hire the people, run the gas station, deliver, deliver the oil and gas so people can get in their cars and go to work. Here's what I don't want. I don't want that oil and gas company to tell me what the minimum wage is for the people who work for them. I don't want them to write the rules on pollution about how much they have to pollute. I don't want them to write the tax laws about what kind of taxes they have to pay. And I don't want them to write the rules about how we substitute renewable energy for fossil fuels. But I know, so I am not against the private sector. I'm against the private sector running the government. And so actually, I think the cause of this, and I've spent 10 years sort of peeling the onion on American democracy about why it isn't working, why it's broken, and it's corporate cash. And to the extent that people in the financial sector are part of that corporate cash to push for those you know, laws and rules to benefit themselves at the expense of everybody else, then that's true. But it's really, when you go to the heart of it, you can see we have the highest drug prices in the world because the drug companies want it and the people in Congress give it to them. That's why we pay twice as much. You know, I, I think today, Mr. Trump said he was, gonna he was gonna pass a regulation that let people go to Canada to buy their drugs. Do you understand what a failure that is? That the president is saying that our system is so bad that we're gonna make it possible to use somebody else's system? The sec that was the, so the first question was about inequality. That is what's driving it. 
The second question was about uh, hedge fund managers were responsible for the financial crisis of 2008. So the financial crisis, okay, it's exi if you look at the financial crisis of 2008, which I think I spend a reasonable amount of time looking at in horror, it really came down to fraud, mortgage fraud. People in the United States didn't understand what they were doing, and a bunch of people made a lot of money giving them mortgages with high fees associated with them that they could never pay back. And no, it, people, those big, it actually was huge banks and mortgage brokers making billions of dollars, basically writing mortgages for people they could never pay off and then selling the mortgages into the market. That's what they were doing and taking a huge fee up front. It's kind of a game of musical chairs. But this is a perfect example ex of what I'm talking about. They were taking advantage of people because they knew the key point was the footnote on page 67. Nobody who was buying a house and taking out a mortgage knew the key point was the footnote on page 67, and they never told them. They were taking advantage of people. There was a massive fraud perpetrated by banks on home, home buyers, and they did pay big fines but they never went to jail. So when I think about this, this was a classic case of corporations writing the laws so they could do what they want, bringing down the American economy and the world economy, and there was no criminal liability. And I look at that and I say, okay, fraud on the American people in massive scale, that's a crime. Selling opioids in huge scale, to American young people and hooking them intentionally, that's a crime. There's something going on here where the pursuit of profit to the exclusion of any other sentiment cannot be permitted in this society. And we've allowed it, and we've allowed these corporations to do it and to write the laws governing them. So when, you think, when I think about the mortgage crisis, the first thing I say is, those banks were acting fraudulently. They were too big. They were too powerful. They were never really held to account. It's a classic example of what I'm talking about, of corporations running America for themselves and the government not standing up for the American people. And that is a perfect example of what I'm against. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Terrence. And quickly, Mr. Sarah, to just follow on Terrence's question. So when you were a hedge fund manager, what did you invest in? How, how did you make your money? Look, we invested in every part of the American by industry until I started to s say some things I just can't, you know, like fo fossil fuels, I came to the conclusion, oh my God, we have this huge climate crisis. That's one of the reasons I left my job and divested from that and, st and started working to get a, a correct climate solution. But let me make a point about investing and the way I see it. The way you do well investing is actually by growing companies. If you do the math, the way that you do well, the way that Warren Buffett does well, is buying companies that grow, that their revenues go up, and that means they're gonna be hiring more people, training more people, selling more goods and services, and everything is gonna grow together. And that's actually what we believed in, was I never thought that it was smart to, th to like, wi you don't win by cutting. You win by growing. And that was what I thought when I was an investor. That's actually how you make money over a long period of time, is by compounding in something good, not by doing a series of clever trades along the way. And so when I think about it, there's a bunch of it. You can look at industries and see that is an industry that has the wind at its back. And if you have a good management team, you can, then you can do part of that. And you can create something over a long period of time that works well. And that's actually was my philosophy of business, and that's what I'm talking about here. You know, if you think about when I was in business, I had a philosophy that I wanted to have a fair relationship with everybody for a long period of time. That I wanted to have the same lawyer and the same accountant and the same representative and pay them fairly and have a good deal so we could keep doing things without a lot of change. That that's how you create value over time is a series of fair, positive 
deals that you do together and then you do it again. A thousand good deals, not one deal where you rip everybody off. And that's the difference between me and Mr. Trump. He's a guy who thinks the way you win is by ripping people off. And what I think is the way you win is by creating something together openly and honestly and fairly, not trying to take advantage, but try and build something together so everybody wins. And that's how we ran our business. And that's why I honestly think that's the only way over time that you actually build value. Next question comes from Kathleen Hoy. Hi, Tom. Hi. Um, so you uh, talked about this already a little bit. Um, my question is, how, as president, would you address the high cost of prescription drugs so that people can get the treatment they need and not sacrifice their basic yes. needs? So drug pricing is one of the most emotional topics in America because at some level, drug companies are coming up with things, and they're going to continue <coughs> to come up with things that are going to save lives and make people be able to live much more healthily while they're alive. And I think it, we should start by saying part of the genius of America is we are going to solve a lot of things that would have killed us a generation ago. You know, you think about breast cancer. That used to be a death sentence. Leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The American medical research, you know, cohort is doing and has done incredible things for us. And that's part of you know, the great part of America. But the way it works, I don't know how much you guys know about this, is, but basically, if you get a new drug that's permitted by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, you get a patent on it. The only you can make it for seven years. And you get to charge whatever you want. Which, if you have a drug that's going to keep people alive, you can charge a lot. We all know that. But at the end of seven years, the patent's supposed to run out. And that's when the system gets really spooky, and I'll tell you why. They do a bunch of things that, in my mind, the government should never allow them to do. They do a bunch of things to extend that patent for years so that instead of it going from being on patent to become a generic drug that everybody can make, they extend it in a variety of ways, including ways that I consider straightforwardly unethical. And that is where I think we have the problem, because I know that we have to incent people to risk hundreds of millions of dollars to develop that drug in the first place. And they should be able to, to charge. But the issue for us is going to be, how do we control that over time? And haven't they gone to a place that is too greedy? And I'll give you an example. You know, at the beginning of this year, on January 1st, hundreds of drugs had their prices lifted. The cost did not go up of creating those drugs. So the question is, doesn't the government within this system have to go back and fight to keep these drug costs down? Because we pay more than any other country for the same drugs. That's why people go to Canada to get their drugs, because they're so much cheaper. They're so much cheaper in Europe. We don't fight to keep those drug costs down here. And so my point on this would be, yeah, we have to incent the research and development of drugs. And we have to fight to make them affordable for Americans because we want them to be created and we want them to be affordable for everybody. There's no point in having great health care that no one can afford. And so we should be, f these companies have gone way too far. They want to write the rules. They c you know, it's illegal to go to Canada to buy your drugs. Why would that be true? Only if this system were so broken as it is. And so I look at this as, you're gonna have to get up every single day and fight these people. We're gonna have to break, I keep saying, the w we only have to do two things. Break the stranglehold these corporations have in our government. Drug prices are a perfect example. We're going to have to do that. I mean, I'm talking about structural change in American government, the federal level, to break their control. And this is the poster child for bad behavior by corporations, drug pricing. So, I mean, I, have to, I, mean, I don't want to answer you too long, but I'm talking about term limits for Congress, 12 years so that they don't just want to stay in forever, but they want to get things done. A national referendum, if, if they won't act, go directly and have a vote of the people to change the law. Easy to vote, you know, do all the non-voter suppression things, which I don't think used to happen in New Hampshire, but watching what's happened with college students, actually there's an attempt to suppress college voting. And lastly, corporations are not people. That's in the law of the United States, corporations are people. That's ridiculous. Anyone can tell 
They don't have a heart and soul. They're only solely focused on money. They are not people. They should not have the rights of American citizens. So when I think about drug pricing, this is going to be the poster child that they cannot run us around. They cannot write the laws for themselves. They cannot extend the laws and manipulate the laws to be able to keep things on patent for multiples of what the law says they can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Kathleen. Next question comes from George Matthews. Thank you for coming to New Hampshire. The current occupant of the White House has decimated our international standing as an ally. <coughs> from North Korea to Iran and many places in between, this man has embarrassed our country with immature bluster and extremely dangerous talk. Please tell me how you would approach foreign policy and security of our great nation. So George, thank you for that question. And actually the answer is exactly in line with how I was talking about investing. You know, we have a long history of relationships with countries. And some of them are, are close allies, and that doesn't mean we agree with them on everything, but it means we should trust each other and work together. And some of them I would describe as frenemies. Like, we are hooked together, but they're competitive with us. They may not play by our rules, and we absolutely have to stand up for our interests in dealing with them while knowing that we can't, it cannot be one long confrontation that we're going to have to work together in spite of our differences and in spite of the fact that they may be cheating. So when I think about what we're going to try and do, it's really important around the world that people think what they thought about America, that we're the moral leaders, that we do the right thing. It's incredibly valuable to us to have people trust us. And the whole idea that America first, which is we have no allies, we have no shared interests, the way that we get rich is by taking money out of your pocket, and we know darn well that you're trying to take money out of our pocket, so we're prepared to defend ourselves from your attacks, could not be stupider and more incompetent and less successful. Because we're in a world that is, mo if you think about the 21st century, the world's just going like this. The, everybody know, can see everybody else's world in their hand. They can, you can look in your phone, and everybody has a phone in the world, and see what Florence looks like or Manchester. The trade is at a level that it's never been before. The industrial supply chains are linked in a way they've never been before. The idea that we can be separate from other countries in the world is absurd. And if you look at climate and realize how much we need to solve problems together going forward, the idea that we aren't cooperative, trusting allies with other people is also incompetent and absurd. So from my point of view, we have to reassert the idea that we are a trustworthy, honest partner who stands up and does the right thing and sticks up for itself uncompromisingly when people try and take advantage of us. That's who we've always been. We're going to have to be that country again, and we should take great pride in it. You know, Madeleine Albright called us the indispensable country. We can't do it by ourselves, but they can't do it without us. And that's what we have to go back to being Americans. We lead the world. We stand up for what's right. We make things happen in a good way for us and for everybody else. Thank you, Thank you George. We've got a Facebook question coming in here from Robert Sabian. He asks, have you ever bought a gun? <laughs> so let me say this. I have never purchased a gun, but I've inherited guns. So my grandfather, who was a ended up being a research scientist. But when he was a senior in high school, he ran away from home. He was living in Western Pennsylvania. He ran away from home, he changed his name, and he became a cowboy in North Dakota. And he worked as a cowboy for a couple years, and then he went to the man running his ranch because he realized it wasn't gonna work. He, all his friends who were cowboys we're getting hurt. It's a really dangerous occupation. He loved it, but he realized this is going to be a place where I end up kind of a crippled old cowboy pretty darn soon. So he went to the man running the ranch and he said, you don't know who I am, but if you'll give me train fare back home, I promise you I'll send it back when I get there. And then I said, George, your father tracked you down in two weeks. I know exactly who you are. <laughs> and so he went back and went to college and became a doctor and a research doctor and worked on some of the really early breakthroughs, he's a uh, cardiologist, worked on the first electrocardiogram. 
But his whole life, he was a fanatical fisherman and hunter. He loved the out of doors, and he you know, loved being there, and part of what he loved to do was fishing and hunting, and he you know, had heads, and he had a lot of guns, and I inherited some of them. So I've, since I've been a kid, we actually, I, I've been somebody who's had guns around the house, and I, we actually, we have a cattle ranch raising grass-finished cattle to show that it actually sequesters carbon net in the soil that you can raise animals in a way that's very good environmentally. And we give gun safety on our ranch. So in fact, we have people come to the ranch and anyone in the community who wants to learn how to use a gun safely can come and all our kids have done it and I've done it a few times because it's super fun to learn what guns can do, to learn how to use them safely and to make sure that if you are a hunter that you do it in a way that doesn't endanger anybody else. So yeah, all right. never bought them, but I've owned them. Next question, we're under 10 minutes here. We're gonna get to a few more questions if we can. Next question comes from Brian Harlow. Oh, good to meet you. Brian, Tom, nice to meet you. Um, keeping in mind that a major contributor to addiction is unresolved childhood trauma, if elected, how would a Steyer administration address the opioid crisis in New Hampshire, as well as the problem of grand families needing to raise the children of those with substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. So, addiction is a huge health issue, a mental health issue in the United States that is all over the country and incredibly painful for everybody involved, both the people who are addicted, their families, their communities. It's not one person gets hurt. The, hurt, the pain goes, spirals out to everybody. And I think we have to look at it in a bunch of ways. First of all, it's a health issue for the people who are addicted. And we've got to look at it as a way of how can we help them deal with their problem in a way that's most effective. I think we also have to ask ourselves, why are people getting addicted in the first place? And is somebody I think everybody probably in the United States at this point has a close friend, the child of a friend, or a relative who's been involved with addiction. I have, and I know what it costs, and I'm very aware of how bad and how desperate it can become. So I look at this as partly a question of why are people getting addicted? What is going on in our society that people would make that choice? I then look at the people who are supplying them and trying to get them addicted and view that as a straight up crime that is unconscionable and that I would be <laughs> very straightforward in dealing with. And then I look at the people who are addicted and talk about how do you get them back to being productive members of society. And as somebody, I mean, I think the most prevalent addiction in the United States is alcohol. And I, I've definitely had lots of relatives who are addicted to alcohol and I know that the only way that people get through that addiction is by going through a program where they have to beat it every day and it becomes a central focus of their life. You can't just beat it out of your hip pocket. You have to beat it every day. You have to go through pro programs. You have to have support systems to make it happen. And we should make it possible for people to, to do that. But I think that this is a question, honestly, about the heart and soul of America. Because if you look at people in these desperate situations, I think the idea about vilifying them and blaming them as opposed to helping them is a huge mistake. And at the same time, I know when my mom was teaching reading in the Brooklyn House of Detention, so she's like a 60-year-old lady, and I said, so mom, what's everybody in for? What, what are people in, in jail for? And she goes, drugs. Everybody's in for drugs. Some people are in for selling drugs. Some people are in for robbing so they can get money for drugs. Some people are in for, but it's all about drugs, Tom, in the Brooklyn House of Detention. And that was 30 years ago. So I know that their cost to society, spiritual, their cost to society about crime. And I know that for us to heal this, we're gonna have to understand where people are and support them in getting to a place that they'd like to be. And I know that vilifying them, of course we have to enforce the laws of the United States of America. 
but we have to understand where people are too and help them get to a place where they can get back to being productive members. And that is what I would do, because to me, this is a spiritual question for the United States. How can we think of ourselves as a society that's flourishing and has purposes and where purpose, and where people understand what we're doing on the earth, if we have soaring ad addiction rates and soaring suicide rates? We should ask ourselves, don't we need a new vision of what we're doing in America together? Don't we need more optimism about what we're creating? Don't we have to recreate the optimistic, brave, compassionate country that we've always been? That's what I want to do. Thank you, Brian. Thank much you. appreciated. Next question comes from Sherry Schmidt. Hi. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome to New Hampshire. Thank you. Um, do you have a plan for what you'll do as president if the Democrats retake the White House but fail to flip the Senate? And how will you handle Majority Leader McConnell, if he's reelected, blocking critical legislation and pushing through partisan GOP nominees? So let me say this. My go-to move in everything political is going to be to go to the people. So I said I would declare a state of emergency on day one for climate, because we can't wait. The timing on that is it's urgent, it's an emergency, treat it with the seriousness and urgency that the issue demands. But I also believe that what's going on, and I think what Mr. McConnell so cleverly and ingeniously supports is this corporate takeover of America. And he does it consistently without any concern for the American people or any concern in my mind for ethics. And I think if you saw that he refused to let the law to get to the Senate about protecting our democracy from Russian hacking? It's, it's like, are you kidding me? Because they're hacking on your behalf, you're going to let a foreign country, a hostile foreign country attack the democracy? That's, you're good with that? So my attitude would be, if that happens, and I really don't think it's going to happen, I think we're going to have a sweeping victory. And, you know, I'm committed to all of the grassroots stuff that we've done for years, knocking, knocking on doors, being on campuses, all of the organizing face-to-face -face that we've done, and we're the biggest in the country, I guarantee we're doing that no matter what. But if in fact what you describe happens, my attitude would be, I would go to the American people. The biggest advantage the president has is he or she gets to set the agenda. Trump talks about immigration, suddenly immigration's the issue. Trump talks about racism, suddenly racism is the issue. The issue in this is gonna be, we need to get democracy back to the people. And I would spend all my time going to the people and calling it out and calling him out. Look, we can't be polite about this anymore. I think Democrats have been lying for Republicans for years in hopes that they would like us enough to do deals. I'm, I'm over that. They haven't done any deals. Mitch McConnell hasn't done anything straight up with Democrats for, as far as I know, ever. The first thing he said about Barack Obama was, my job is to make him a one-term president, not my job is to serve the American people, not my job is to make sure that everyone's life is better. My job is to win politically against the Democrats. Okay, my job, as far as I'm concerned, is to give the power back to the American people so we can decide what's right. And that is involved going out and talking to people and explaining where we are and why. Because we're going to have to decide. This isn't happening unless the American people want it to happen unless we have, honestly, a huge sweeping democratic change, which is going to happen. We're going to have that change. And it's going to be the American people insisting on retaking the democracy and getting back the government. And that's what I want to be part of. That's why I'm running. And that's going to be the answer to Mitch McConnell. You, did you see he was being called yesterday on, on, on uh, the internet? He was being calling Moscow Mitch McTreason. <laughs> so that's what we're going to have to do. It's, it's going to be the American people who are going to take down Mitch McConnell. It's going to be the American people who take down Donald Trump. It's going to be the American people who take down this whole group who've sold out to the companies, who've gone completely rogue on democracy. And we're going to have to take it back. And we're going to. And I want to be part of it. And I'm incredibly excited about it, to be honest. Thank you. Sherry Schmidt, thank you for your question. And Tom Steyer, thank you for answering all these questions. We've hit 30 <laughs> minutes. I probably went quickly for you, didn't it? Uh, it's just starting. I refuse thank you to, to leave. The I'm candidate. not leaving. Thank you to the studio <laughs> audience, and thanks to all who are watching. Have a great evening. Thank you, guys.
Now you can go shake some hands.